Hi, this is Steve Shu. Welcome to Manifold. This week I interviewed Jan Tallinn on the coronavirus, existential risk, and AI. Unfortunately, Corey was not able to join us due to some technical difficulties, but I hope you enjoy the episode. Our guest today is Jan Tallinn. Jan was trained in theoretical physics in Estonia. He was a founder of Skype and is a prominent super angel investor in technology startups all around the world. As an example, he was an early investor in the AI company DeepMind, which was later acquired by Google. DeepMind is famous for many things, but one of the things they're famous for is having created the first superhuman Go AI called AlphaGo. I'd like to start, Jan, with just uh, some personal details about you for our audience. Uh, our audience is mostly, I would say, it's some distribution of scientists and university professors, technologists, startup people, uh, but it's, it's very diverse. Uh, also some writers and artists and things like this. So um, not everyone will be familiar with you. So I just thought I'd go into your background just a little bit. Now, my impression of you, if I were to describe you to other people, is that you're basically at this point in your life living what I, you're doing what I would call living the dream. Uh, because you live in your beautiful home in Tallinn, Estonia, but oftentimes you're, you seem to be jet-setting around the world. And I always, I mostly run into you at really fancy meetings full of all kinds of interesting people discussing interesting topics. But maybe you could just describe for a moment what, what a day or a month or a year is like for you these days. Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Yeah, I travel about like 40% of my time. Uh, so, uh, and when I'm home, I work from home. So like, there's like uh, very little impact that this current crisis is having on me, except that uh, the travel is uh, not happening really. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of try to maximize the amount of uh, time that I spend on uh, converging or like conversing with people whose Sort of ability to think I respect. So one of the focuses or that of yours that I think we're going to spend maybe most of the time on is existential risk for humanity. So you're, you're trying to do good for humanity by uh, addressing and raising awareness about existential risk. If you were to sort of uh, categorize the various buckets in which you're spending your time right now, how much of it is on that specific thing versus looking at companies uh, versus other activities? So like for the last decade or so, it has been sort of 50-50 on, uh, on investing. In the professional time goes like 50, half of it goes to investing and half of it goes into, yeah, sort of preparing talks, for example, or, or uh, doing philanthropy, etc. And for the last year or two i've been kind of trying to reduce the amount of time that i spend on investing uh, so i've hired someone uh, who is doing like most of the legwork investing in order to kind of leave me more time for uh, actually saving the world yes yeah so I, I think when i first met you i was really obviously i knew about skype and things like your your tech startup activities but i was really impressed that you seem to have reached a stage in your life where you're really actually you know, at least 50% focused on trying to save the world. And very few people, uh, even people who are billionaires and have all the time uh, in the world and resources to, to do it, are, are trying to do that in the, in the effective way that you are. So that was what I think impressed me the most. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised how, how few people there are. Like what, one of my first meetings when, uh, when I got cut into this uh, existential risk reduction business was with Peter Thiel, and if I remember correctly, like he said that, uh, look, it's going to be like, I went to him with a sort of laundry list of items that I could be doing with my time and brand. And very high up, up there was, uh, I should be kind of trying to recruit wealthy people for this course because like nobody seems to be paying attention to that. And that if I remember correctly, Peter said this, it's, it's, you're not going to be successful doing that. Like there's, there's, there's no point in talking to them. Like, uh, and, uh, and yeah, he was right. Like I ended up talking to about like a dozen billionaires or so. And yeah, I have very little to show for it. Like uh, the act that the sort of billionaires like um, Elon Musk and uh, Dustin Moskowitz, like uh, they got 
that'll be interested in this course uh, completely independently of me. I see. You know, this uh, COVID-19 situation is an interesting test because here, of course, the risk is it's not really existential, um, but it's very concrete. And so the question is, what fraction of billionaires, and I think already there's some positive signals from people like Bill Gates and others, that, that there will be some uh, you know, participation by the fantastically wealthy to help uh, solve this problem. But of course, existential risk is something where we may be looking out 100 years or 200 years and trying to do something now. And I think that's much harder for uh, even these smart billionaires to wrap their brains around. Oh, yeah, the big, big problem with... Um so-called like tail risks, uh, risks that are conceptually there, but we have no experience with them. Yeah, is that uh, they're very hard to intuitively grasp and be, I mean, even I find it difficult to kind of uh, be, uh, kind of sell to my system one, so to speak, that look, that <laughs> there might be a sort of big danger uh, just across the horizon. In that sense, I do think that the COVID crisis is, uh, I call it kind of minimum viable global catastrophe, uh, because it, it, it totally qualifies, I think, as a, as a global catastrophe, while still having like relatively mild uh, still uh, effects. Although like, uh, this is of course relative, I'm just thinking that uh, in terms of like possible global catastrophe that we could be having, uh, this is one of the mildest. Yes, yeah, someone actually claimed to me uh, or advocated the viewpoint that this is actually, okay, it's bad in that a lot of people are going to die and there's uh, some you know, problems for the economy. But in the long run, it's quite good because, as you said, it's a minimum viable crisis. So uh, in terms of the number of people that are going to die and the, the economic damage, it's just enough that it'll focus attention, uh, at least on this particular uh, risk of pandemics and maybe a more dangerous kind of uh, virus in the future. But uh, you know, we, we will be able to get through it and maybe we'll build systems, we'll put some systems in place that'll be useful when something much more serious comes along. Exactly. So do you have any personal, maybe non-obvious, to use the dialogue terminology, um, any non-obvious kind of near-term implications of uh, coronavirus that you know, they're not widely understood? So I do think and hope uh, that one thing, I'm not sure if, if it's like very non-obvious, but I do think that there is uh, this value of having something external to humanity, having like species-wide problem and something that's external to kind of human affairs is calling, calling the bullshit, so to speak. So like uh, if, if somebody's making like outrageously wrong predictions, you will see that they are wrong, like in just a few weeks time. Conversely, it kind of surfaces kind of good, clear thinking and good leadership because the effects of that uh, are going to be seen very quickly. It's in that sense, it's like, like a war, right? So like uh, war is obviously a horrible thing, but like the sort of good side effect of that, of a war is that you will get leaders that are able to save lives uh, because you can just go through as generals until you find someone who, is, who's, who will kind of... Uh, win battles. Uh, so I do think that there might be, although obviously much more milder, milder effect uh, from this crisis than it, than it would be from, from an actual war. This is a very interesting experiment because every country in the world is affected. And so after the whole crisis is over, you'll be able to conclude who did the right thing, who was properly calibrated, who understood things the fastest and reacted effectively. The problem I have is that other than a small group of rationalists and uh, very sort of data-driven uh, smart people, um, the rest of the world might not take the best lessons from this. And there will be very active propagandizing and retconning of history and events. Uh, people have very strong motivations to do this. And so um, while the story, I think, is knowable, that the, the sort of uh, analysis of it is knowable, whether it will be known by uh, large numbers of people on the planet, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, I agree that uh, there's definitely a lot of incentives to kind of mis misrepresent the history, etc. Once this is over, however, the nice thing is that people who care actually about the truth, they can go through the history and look at like who who the good leaders were. They're, in that sense, at least in this like smaller circle, there will be like knowledge, like uh, who 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 seem to have done like better job than the others. 
And uh, if there's a next catastrophe, the, in that sense, the world will be uh, somewhat better prepared because we, we know who, who managed to do it well. And yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, this, this is a little bit ghoulish, but I was just thinking that after sort of going through an intense period of time where I myself was kind of trying to analyze the epidemiology and trying to figure out what, what are the proper, you know, well-calibrated projections one can make about this. Um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of my thinking is recorded on my blog, so people can go and check me on it. But I started to think this is going to be a longer term thing. And, um, uh, you know, maybe there are actually some pretty huge startup opportunities coming from this, because if you properly predict what the world will be like one or two years from now, post uh, COVID, maybe there are some rather obvious uh, startup ideas, which, you know, could be big winners. Uh, and the people who act on those, uh, who are properly calibrated and act on those ideas are going to win. So have you, have you given that any thought? So uh, a little bit, but I've done it like most in the context of uh, what, uh, you know, public stock will do well. Yes. And uh, there's certain like a sort of like a sub section of the rationality community that I know that have been giving like quite a lot of thought into what sort of proper prices, how, how the stock market should be should react, and uh, and then basically have been literally profiting from the fact that it didn't, which is an interesting fact that uh, that the markets generally are regarded very highly uh, in rationality circles, but now they were. People were like, wait a minute, like, why aren't they reacting? Like, okay, I guess I better make my bets now. Yeah, this is a very interesting point. So I'm a little bit older than I think the main body of people that are in the rationality movement. And so I've seen a couple of financial crises before, in fact, did some kind of deep analysis of some of them. And so I, I was fully aware that uh, efficiency of the market is limited and, and it, can be, it can misprice assets for very long periods of time. And so I wasn't surprised. One of the very first bits of frantic analysis I had to do when I first heard about all this was to figure out when I should get out of, you know, sell all my equity positions and go to cash. And so I had to, that was like the very first thing I had to figure out what to do. I think I performed reasonably well. Like I was basically sold very close to the peak actually. So uh, that turned out pretty well for me. But one point I want to make for our listeners is, you know, we have a lot of academics and traditional kind of more mainstream scientists and such um, that listen to this podcast. And I, I detect that there isn't a very strong cross fertilization between uh, what I call the rationalist movement, which is typically younger people, maybe a little more focused in tech, but who are really focused on trying to perfect their calibration, reasoning about the world, how to do Bayesian updates, how to, how to really process this data properly and come to the, the most robust conclusions. There isn't a, that much cross-fertilization between these other communities, which I think would be very open to the rationalist worldview, but there just isn't, you know, they don't tend to go online and read those websites that the rationalists are on. And this even extends to, for example, the hedge fund community, which, you know, obviously clearly needs good predictions for what's going to happen. And um, so uh, one, one advertisement, maybe we'll put some links in the um, show notes, uh, to some of the rationalist websites, and I'll encourage some of the scientists and academics and others to go there and read their their stuff. Yeah, like, I think the less wrong uh, uh, website and community has been doing like, like significantly above average job when it comes to uh, you know digesting the information from the current crisis and and then you know forming interesting opinions. Right. And, and even a third sliver of, of uh, culture here is the super, super, which overlaps a little bit with the other ones that I mentioned, but there's also the super forecaster community. And I think last time I checked, uh, maybe that was like a month ago or a little more, um, it seemed to me their, the central values of their predictions were pretty well calibrated. In other words, they, they seem to have predictions by, I don't know, mid-February, early March that look to me like they're going to be reasonably correct. And so it's a whole nother community that's trying to get things right. And the third one is uh, Metaculus, that I am also a small investor there. But actually, one of the concrete things that I did within, in this crisis, I just uh, gave them a donation uh, so they could better build up their specific kind of pandemic focused uh, prediction market there. Right. I, I'm going to tell a little bit of story, a story that it, it contains a little bit of confidential information, but I think our listeners will like it. So maybe you'll like it too, Jan. Um, 
It has to do with the British response, the UK response to this crisis. So what it ha- and, and this has been reported somewhat in the media, somewhat intensely in the UK media, but because there are vested interests there, I don't think it was reported really very accurately. But, but I, can, I, I have some insight into this. And so what happened there is they had a pre-existing pandemic plan, which was formulated, I think, as early as maybe 2011, but then it was restudied again in around 2014, 2016, in actual official government uh, uh, sponsored studies and simulations. And that's where this herd immunity idea came from, that maybe the smartest thing to do would just be to let it you know, cocoon the most vulnerable people and let it kind of sweep through the younger, less vulnerable population. And then you wouldn't have to stop the economy to deal with the virus. And so the, the present government basically inherited that plan from previous administrations. It was, it was embedded already in the civil service, et cetera, et cetera. And it was only through very kind of rationalist thinking where they realized, okay, but these early analyses have a problem that they were simulating kind of a, a flu. They didn't know, actually know what we were going to be confronting now. And there were key parameters that were off relative to coronavirus, like this need for ventilators. And so they, after a while, realized, and there was a very kind of complicated back and forth struggle, which was really kind of updating on data uh, among different uh, groups in the government, that led them to eventually move away from this herd immunity plan that they had inherited. And um, it, it really was a real time situation where a government was trying to figure out what was going on. They had a plan in place, but it was kind of the wrong plan, and they had to figure out. Uh, both through simulation and through what physicists would call kind of Fermi estimates of just trying to get the most robust uh, prediction of what's going to happen based on the early data. But they finally then moved away from herd immunity and they're basically executing kind of lockdown like most countries are now. Yeah, when I when I heard about uh, their initial plan, my reaction was that I'm kind of glad on a meta level that like uh, there are countries who are doing some other things <laughs> than the rest, of the, <laughs> the rest of the world. So like yes. we, will, we will see even if they are Incorrect. And it wasn't obvious at all to me that, that they were in, the initial plan was incorrect because, like, even if you think about like what are the actual numbers, like if you assume that uh, uh, you know, the infection to fatality rate is uh, something like one percent, like all in, uh, then that that gives you roughly the same mortality that you that you get in the world naturally, like about one percent of people. Uh, so it's not like obvious that 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 you should be like super afraid of it but like there are second order questions indeed like uh, like what, what kind of effect what what kind of the second order effects will be that uh, that might kind of um, tip the scales and i would even say although it's very cold blooded that if you do a a full blown cost benefit analysis and you price lives or you price quality adjusted years of life qualities that you could argue that our response has been somewhat overboard on this, and we, you know, maybe from a purely numerical perspective, we should have let it sweep through and just done our best to cocoon the vulnerable people. Um, you could make that argument. I, if someone really wants to make that argument, I wouldn't call them a monster or um, mm-hmm. logically incorrect. Uh, they may just have different parameter values for pricing qualities than me. I agree. And the sec, the additional subtlety of this is if you're a politician you might just say, look, I don't want this really traumatic stuff to be happening during my term as prime minister or president. And so you might err you know, very strongly uh, toward the side of just uh, having as, as little trauma as possible for your society, even if it, this cost-benefit analysis doesn't justify it. Yeah, that seems, uh, that seems tr- true as well. In that sense, I do think that it's uh, interesting to see you got the differences between democratic countries and uh, authoritarian countries although i'm not sure like how big they're different i mean authoritarians still have to be kind of like uh kind of they're not like completely free uh in, in their in their actions and policies yeah i think it's exactly right i mean i think that you might have one at level of analysis might have said hey the the public the the um popularly elected people have to really worry about this issue of um optics but in China also, I think she would, was very worried that he would get tarred with, if they had responded poorly to this, mm-hmm. then he, that would be on a big, huge stain on his record too. So um, everybody has to worry about that, I think, uh, except maybe like in North Korea or something. <laughs> um, let's, uh, do you have any more thoughts on coronavirus? Do you want to maybe, maybe give us your central 
sort of prediction for what the world will look like uh, in two months and six months and one year? Yeah, I'm, I'm like more than a little concerned uh, that uh, kind of uh, like this lockdown regime will kind of last much longer than I would like. Uh, they might have to last last for like more than a year because of like the vaccine isn't there and before the vaccine there isn't really like a big reason. Uh, I hope that I'm wrong, um, that kind of treatments will be available that would kind of uh, take the edge of the virus. I, I do think that it's valuable to compare the crisis to kind of a previous uh, global crisis like World War II, like what, and I, if I'm, unless I'm wrong, I think the world bounced back pretty quickly after World War II. So in that sense, I'm not super concerned about long-term effects on economy. Uh, I do think that there will be long-term effects on like various sectors on economy. I think it's like totally possible that the kind of commercial air traffic uh, will take like a long time uh, to recover as people basically settle in, into their new new forms of, uh, of doing work. Uh, I even saw this like a joke recently that uh, there was a questionnaire like, like who was responsible for your uh, policy of working from home, CEO, CTO or COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to throw out a couple of uh, ideas. Uh, one is I think there's a pretty decent chance that we might not get a vaccine for a year or well over a year. It'll be interesting to see whether governments get into a kind of Manhattan Project mode where they're really trying out of the box things and expending large scale resources to try to get the vaccine here earlier and maybe even be much more willing to take risks in testing the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So that's that's an interesting question for me. Um, another one is whether the sort of uh, remote education, remote meetings, uh, video conferencing, all that, um, because of this event, everybody's exposed to it and it sort of passes a tipping point where it becomes much more acceptable. Virtual conferences, virtual kinds of ways of interacting, I think people uh, you know, may develop. So that's an interesting question for me. And then a third interesting question for me is um, how this will affect relationships between the West and China. You know, who will win the propaganda war for pinning blame on this uh, for the virus uh, and what it'll do to you know globalization and things like that. Yeah, personally, I really, really hope that like uh, having encountered this species-wide problem gives like a good angle for people going to advocate greater co cooperation among species, uh, like global cooperation. Uh, but like, yeah, it kind of remains to be seen, like what, how it how the, how it will fall out in the end. I think that having struggled with this, in a sense, kind of small, non-existential crisis, I hope it will leave us with better systems in place to deal with the big ones that are likely to come. And I think probably public intellectuals and leaders like yourself should be out there emphasizing that, you know, this was a, this was a predicted and predictable uh, risk that actually materialized. And so maybe it'll make people a little more comfortable in going further out in the tail or further forward in time in preparation and planning for yeah, so uh, I, things that might come. I think it's like one of the struggles, especially in, like in AI risk uh, community, the things that we struggle with is, is like kind of this universal, oh, this is just science, just, this is just science fiction counter argument. Uh, and I do think that like, this crisis will uh, give, give some counter counter arguments to that uh, that everything in tail tail risks or science fiction risks right i mean the the vivid one I remember is people's i forgot who said this I think it was a probably a pretty prominent AI researcher who said this it's like a existential AI risk is like worrying about the population overpopulation on Mars or something like this right it's, and, and wrong, yeah. oh was it him okay yes mm -hmm. yeah so um, yeah. So let's let's turn to that because I my sense is correct me if I'm wrong that AI risk is the main existential risk that you're concerned with because I think you've also spoken about biological existential risk but I think AI risk is the one that you spend most of your cycles thinking about. Yes, uh, so I do think that the uh, top three risks uh, that might wipe out the humanity, uh, in my view, are AI, bio, and unknown unknowns. Uh, because like both AI and bio are less than 100 years old when it comes to uh, considering them as global risks. Uh, where, where do you where do you put just the old one that's been around for a while, uh, just nuclear war? Uh, I think it's 
based on what I know right now, uh, I think it's very unlikely to be an existential risk. Uh, it uh, turns out like if you even, if you detonate all the nuclear arsenal uh, that humanity has, it will be, it definitely will not kill everyone by just uh, sort of the first order effects. There might be some like second order effects uh, that would lead to kind of like collapse of civilization and then kind of uh, going out with a whimper, so to speak. Uh, but of course, like there's still like non non zero chance that that uh, like people who have been analyzing this uh, are wrong. Uh, so 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 like the nuclear's nuclear still is like non zero existential risk. Uh, interestingly, I think nuclear was the first existential risk that humanity uh, encountered, and I think there was a decade uh, in the 30s, uh, in, from the mid 30s to the mid 40s, during which nuclear was like a full blown uh like full-blown existential risk because that was the risk between that was the period between the invention of the nuclear uh chain reaction and the first test uh of the of the nuclear um nuclear chain reaction and it wasn't clear whether uh this planet will survive uh the first nuclear detonation and there was the first uh, existential risk report that humanity has produced is called the la602 uh concerns about uh uh, ignition of the atmosphere. So uh, yeah, the, the concern was that the first nuclear uh, detonation would cause uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere to to fuse and uh, and thereby basically turn the entire entire planet into into a nitrogen bomb, basically. Yeah. So I, uh, my central projection would be nuclear war would be really terrible for well-being and would set civilization back potentially quite a lot. But as a true existential risk, it doesn't seem likely that even a full-blown nuclear exchange, say, between the U.S. and the Russians or China would actually, you know, eliminate humanity from the earth. We, we would take, maybe take a long time to recover from it, but I don't think it's truly existential. Another, another, issue, issue, another evidence for that is that uh, humanity has done a lot of nuclear blasts already in, in terms of testing. Uh, so like the environment has been able to uh, kind of absorb them over time at least. Uh, so that for what is worth, that's another, another evidence. Yes, yes. Now back to that, what you were calling maybe the first existential risk report. Um, I have to share a little anecdote. So that analysis of whether uh, the first nuclear reaction, uh, nuclear explosion could ignite um, this chain reaction with nitrogen in the atmosphere, burning the atmosphere, um, that was a serious thing to be considered because at that time knowledge was very limited as to the physics of how this all worked. And that calculation was done in a room which was uh, next to Oppenheimer's office on the fourth floor, third or fourth floor of the physics building at Berkeley uh, called LeConte Hall, where I spent, um, I did my PhD there. And at the time when I was a grad student, those offices, the old Oppenheimer offices had been turned into offices for graduate students. And so there, there, I didn't have an office there, but I had friends who would sit in this office where these, and pro, I don't know if the blackboard was still the same blackboard, but it was that room where basically I'd done all these calculations for that very first uh, existential risk analysis of, uh, of nuclear weapons. So, um, so I, I've actually spent a lot of time in that room. <laughs> that's, a, that's an awesome story. I do yeah. think that it's uh, this like, just like super commendable thing uh, that they did. Uh, like every once in a while, I'm not going to mention any names, but like there's this argument that oh, like there have always been like doomsday, doomsday predictors, and and uh, therefore like if next next one comes along, you just shouldn't listen to them. I think the same argument can be shown to be incorrect when you try to apply it uh, to the Manhattan Project people trying to do the analysis whether we are actually going to blow, blow up the planet, because like it's clear that uh, if you Go to that room that to talk about and to say like, look, there always been doomsday doomsday sayers. Why are you why are you here? Like, shouldn't be doing something productive. Uh, like that's that argument just doesn't cut when you when you have like a good uh, reason to be concerned. Yeah, you know, um, in in this podcast series, we've we've done quite a bit on climate science, and I frankly don't see that as anything close to an existential risk. Uh, because, I, well, okay, there, there's some parameter space where maybe there's some very nonlinear evolution of the climate and, it, and then it really is a problem for the human species. But it seems like that risk is relatively low. And, and, and yeah, you, I mean, you might argue that the people that are really passionately pushing 
uh, climate change risk as the most important thing should actually reorient a little bit and think heavily, more heavily about things like AI. Uh, yeah, another approach that I've been, another angle that I've been taking is to sort of reframe uh, AI risk uh, in terms of concern about the environment, because I do think that if, uh, if AI ends up being manifesting as an extension risk, it will manifest uh, through like sudden changes in the environment. Uh, or put it yet another way, like the climate models uh, that uh, sort of indicate the concerning concern about the future, they implicitly assume that humans are still in charge uh, over the over the climate in like uh, 50 or 100 years. And I think it's not obvious at all that we will be. So like, uh, and if we are not in charge, well, we should project this concern to AI uh, and AI like whether we know that humans, as long as we can stay in our biological form, we will continue to be concerned about the environment. By default, AI will not be concerned about the environment at all. The reason why we send robots to space and radioactive areas is that they, not, they do not care about the environment. And they, in fact, may want to continue uh, spewing huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere so that they can power their calculations at giant data centers. I think it's yeah, so. more likely that, that, that they will just get rid of the atmosphere because like, uh, like almost all engineering that they might want to do is probably easier to, done, easier to do in, in vacuum. Uh, and also, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's easier to get rid of the waste heat uh, if you don't have atmosphere between. Yeah, that's probably right. Um, let's back up a second for our listeners who uh, maybe not are not all f very familiar with this concept of AI risk um, and the singularity. So maybe we could start with the most basic pitch you give. So you're at some meeting and Joe billionaire, you know, or Joe president of big country ends up sitting next to you at a dinner table and asks you what you you work on. Uh, what's the what's the sh sort of elevator uh, introduction to this subject uh, that you give to those people. I mean, I have like a different uh, different pitches uh, when it comes to that. Uh, sometimes I even done this thing that where I ask people two questions: A, do you have children? And B, can you program? Then I have like four different quadrants, uh, kind of. Uh, that, you have to fine tune you know, the message. That, yeah, then I can fine tune the message uh, based on those two bits of information, uh, and also my. Kind of pitch and, and my metaphors have kind of evolved over time. I think one of the recent ones uh, that I'm that I'm been trying <laughs> on people is that um, there is this game in rationality community called taboo the word, and the idea is that uh, words have different meanings, so uh, or like different kind of connotations, so. Uh, in order to make the communication clearer, you might want to change the, uh, you know, just taboo the word and, and use something like different words that in, in, in its stead that don't have this connotation. So one way of looking at AI, and this is kind of the start of the pitch, is that it's the process of delegating human decisions to machines. And there, there, there is this intrinsic trade-off between trying to be more productive, more competent, more capable, and staying in control. Like every CEO knows that. Like whenever they need to get more stuff done, they need to delegate. Yet whenever they delegate, they, they yield yield control and they have less control over the, over what's going to happen in the future. And in some ways, humanity is that CEO. We are in the process of reducing the control that we have over the future in order to get more stuff done. And the, and you can so you can imagine this slider that that basically drops over time uh, as, as you proceed to the future. And the problem is that uh, there might be some critical areas where we really, really want to remain under control. One of them is AI development itself. Like once, once we like no longer are in charge of AI development, well, the smartest systems no here will no longer be human controlled or human developed even. So like it's hard to imagine like what, what they're going to do. And uh, the second thing is like, yeah, control over the, over the environment. We really need those narrow parameters so to remain in space, remain in place. If we are going to delegate in way control over the environment, we might go extinct in a matter of minutes. I, I like that way of introducing it a lot because it doesn't have to invoke this leap to AGI, 
right? So what I, what I think a lot of people who are not super technical, and even many people who are super technical, have a problem with is that leap to AGI. And if you just say, we have these mechanistic systems or digital systems that we're, we're handing control off to, at some point it becomes an issue, right? And the trend is obviously clear the way, it, the way it's heading. And so we should just need to think harder about that. I, I, I like that very much. The most, most recent uh, sort of minimum viable dangerous AI definition I heard from uh, was uh, from my friend Andrew Critch. Uh, he defines an AI he called prepotent AI. And there are basically just two assumptions there. One is that uh, this AI is going to have as big impact on the environment uh, as humanity has had, at least as big. And the second is that it's unstoppable. It's either unstoppable because it's too smart for us to stop it, or there are systemic reasons that like, just it's very hard to stop internet, for example. Uh, I think it's still possible to stop internet if you really wanted to as a species, but it's, it's going to be really hard and it's not obviously, obviously doable. So like if we just have those two things, this like logically implies that the effect on environment is going to be just as big as humans are already concerned with. Now, some people would already want to argue that something like free market capitalism or neoliberalism is already that kind of thing that it, it sort of, you know, independent of the actions of George Soros or Bernie Sanders or whatever, there is this monolithic thing, which is building more and more powerful markets and machines and things around the earth and impacting the environment. And humans are, in a sense, kind of powerless to stop it because... Uh, it, it, yeah, I think that in some ways they would be right. Uh, but a really big thing is that like the system that has human components in, the, in it still works at the speed of human thinking. Uh, so like if you're going to replace... Uh, Wet, sil wet carbon with silicon, you might be facing one billion time uh, for, like speed ups that are of a, of a factor of one billion. So uh, in that sense, the, the climate change will no longer be uh, like a problem of this century, it might be a problem of today. Yes, although there is a continuum between that sort of uh, mushy wetware, uh, you know, one second or 100 millisecond time scale to the super fast uh, silicon time scale because humans now are relying, we have this kind of cyborg situation where humans are relying uh, for at least chunks of their thinking or decision-making on silicon. So there's a continuum as we head that in that direction. Yeah, AI Impacts actually has done, an uh, organization called AI, AI Impacts has done some very interesting analysis uh, when it comes to trying to, uh, to look at like what are the discontinuities uh, that we might be uh, seeing from continued technological uh, progress and looking at like what are the what are the past, uh, what were the past uh, kind of discontinuities? Uh, I think the biggest one they found was in explosive power that the introduction of nuclear uh, detonation caused like something like, was it like four or 600 years of progress had to happen yes. over, over a couple of years? Yes. So, so in, the, in the spirit of uh, rationalism, I think we mentioned Andrew Ng, uh, whom we both know uh, a moment ago. Um, you know, he's a smart guy, right? So uh, we might disagree with him, but uh, he's a smart guy. What is the strongest argument against being concerned uh, about AI risk? So I have two arguments that I would be least surprised <laughs> if they were end ended up being true. One of them is a totally crazy one. And, and one of them is a very reasonable one. The reasonable one is that, uh, look, we are facing the world with like many, many problems and AI could be super helpful in alleviating those and addressing those. In, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing on AI, AI safety rather than biosafety. Because if we fix all bio risk, we still have the AI risk to contend with. However, if we fix AI risk uh, and we'll get like very powerful AIs, we're probably going to be able to uh, also fix the other risks, including bio risk. Uh, so I think that is that is a reasonable thing, and 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 like we might, yeah, we might just address so many uh, problems that uh, currently the world is burdened with. Uh, so in that sense, if you actually do the EV calculation, depending on what your parameters are, you might end up end up in a situation where like it's just worth taking the risk of of killing everyone, which like I don't believe that this that argument is true, but uh, I I certainly wouldn't give like zero percent to that being being true. And the other, like the really crazy one, I think like one way of putting it is that humans might be very cheap to, to keep around. Uh, <laughs> and we're fun. 
Yeah, for AI, we are not fun. We're just like statues standing, <laughs> standing in place and, and not, doing, not doing anything. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you look, at, look around, if the universe is real, then, uh, then almost all the resources are outside of this planet. So the, the reason why, I think AI is almost entirely interested in, in the rest of the universe rather than the Earth. The big problem is that uh, it will, by default, use as many resources as it can on this planet in order to get to the rest of the resources out there. There are some reasons why, there's, I've heard some interesting arguments why moral realism might be true. So there might be kind of came theoretically as somebody who is like interested in, in tiny marginal gains at the cost of uh, big losses for other agents, then if you have this trait, it means that you're much harder to cooperate with. Therefore, if you, are, if you have some uncertainty about the need of, of uh, future cooperation, for example, the AI might not be the first one. Like it, it kind of, there's this wonderful story by Scott Alexander called Demiurge's older brother basically describes the situation where the, where the AI wakes up and starts thinking about, am I the first one here? Probably not. What should I, what should I do? And if an AI actually ends up kind of reasoning, came theoretically, what are the, what are the correct things to do? I, I would not be super surprised if it discovers that like uh, being nice to other agents uh, is reasonable when cheap. Right. So I, li I like that train of thought, just to throw a couple things out there. You know, this idea that most of the resources are far from Earth, and there might be some initial transition period where to get off Earth, the AI has to do stuff, and maybe they, that has bad side effects for humans or something. But in the long run, the AI is going to maybe potentially go off into the rest of the universe. There's an old but very pretty well known in physics calculation that Dyson did Dyson uh, Freeman and Dyson just passed away, but mm -hmm. he was trying to understand what is the total amount of computation that could be done in the universe before the end of time. And is it infinite or finite? And uh, so he starts, he starts just asking these questions of, okay, if you're in an expanding universe and entropy is taking over eventually, like how much, how much, how many flops or, you know, uh, how much calculation could you actually do? How much subjective time could the AI experience, you know, before the end of the universe? And, and it, really, it really kind of focuses the idea that, like, the AI will be focused on these much more long-term, you know, mega-scale things than necessarily what's happening on Earth. So I, 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 I like that earlier part of your perspective. And like, once we are, like, in, in this mindset, like, there's another interesting observation that, like, there's a fundamental trade-off in computer science between memory-heavy and uh, sort of CPU heavy computations. Yeah. And it's possible that the utility functions or the goals of AIs that kind of emerge in different parts of the universe, if it's sufficiently large, they will actually kind of uh, differ uh, whether the, the goals are memory heavy or that is memory heavy, meaning basically like you need a lot of matter. Yes. Uh, or they are kind of CPU heavy, uh, computation heavy, which means that you need a lot of time. So there might be kind of interesting uh, of trading happening between different kind of super intelligent AIs if they find, they find themselves places in the universe that are kind of incompatible or relatively incompatible with their utility function that they kind of end up equipped with. But anyway, this is a, this is a sort of philosophical <laughs> area that, that I find super fascinating uh, to think about. Uh, it's kind of prime representative of uh, ideas that I find. There is like a category of ideas which are A, crazy sounding, but B, super important if true. <laughs> and yeah. I naturally find myself very attracted to those ideas. Yeah, it's, it, well, just as a meta remark, it's, just am it's amazing to me how few people, though, uh, allow themselves to actually expend a fair amount of effort or energy in, in, in that direction that you just described. It's, it's pretty natural for people who do like uh, theoretical physics or theoretical computer science or something to be willing to think about these things. But the so many scientists I meet are so kind of practical or focused on their day-to-day -day lab problem that they, they just don't allow themselves ever to even uh, head in that direction, even for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, I, I definitely do have this luxury of, of not uh, being on kind of economic rails and uh, having to kind of solve, <laughs> solve like a stream of uh, incoming problems like every day. On the other hand, I do notice that there's like a significant kind of overrepresentation of physicists in, in this, uh, 
kind of AI safety slash philosophy uh, circles, uh, which I find curious. Well, I think we like and are willing to examine things from first principles. And so that's it's very similar in a way, like this question of, oh, how much computation could happen before the universe dies of heat death. You know, that's very similar, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think it's not, not too surprising to me that uh, physicists are interested in this. Another kind of interesting uh, observation, again, I think I heard it from Andrew Critch, uh, first of all, is that like physicists uh, routinely use this concept of, of phase space. Yes. Or state space, where you basically yeah, I have this like abstract space that describes the kind of current parameters of your of your system, and then as the system evolves, it kind of draws a line in this parameter parametric space or, or, or phase space. And if you can imagine the planet, uh, like all the temperature is like one axis and and humidity is another axis, etc. You put the pla- put Earth on this in this state space, and then you look at the evolution over time. Like there is going to be this line in this space and around it is like a narrow tunnel which corresponds to the parameters within which human survival is possible <laughs> so like the game is like don't touch the wall yeah and exactly you, you can't there's a region a favorable region that you just don't want to leave <laughs> yeah 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 um, so, so that, that's very physicist kind of thought even though andrew critch is, is a mathematician yeah so the the other thing you in your early remarks that i thought uh, i wanted to tease out a little bit which i really liked is this question of the character of the early AIs when they emerge and, and, and what they're like, or maybe, you know, you, you said it in terms of their own game theory analysis, or maybe that was Scott Alexander, but it seems to me, uh, you know, going back to the earlier days of, you know, what uh, Eliezer or Yudkowsky was trying to do, or his people like trying to do kind of pro- provably safe AI, that kind of mathematics, I was always very, sort of pessimistic that anything like that would actually be possible. And I I could give you some arguments for why, but it seems like rather than make sure that we have a provably safe AI, this is the idea that the AI AI has some kind of character that makes it a little bit more beneficent or a little bit more favorable toward humans. That little sliver of difference might make all the difference in the end as to whether humans survive, (laughs) you know, as they're leaving, as they're leaving the planet, they're nice to us, you know, um, Mm -hmm. You know, that seems more likely to be decisive to me than the other thing. I think the most kind of general way of putting uh, this uh, thing is that we want to be able to predict some invariants uh, about AI or like this like ecosystem of AIs uh, once it kind of starts, starts self-generating. Uh, I kind of every once in a while I come back to this like argument I had like, almost 10 years ago with um, like a pretty prominent a- AGI developer who basically wants to accelerate the AI timelines. And he said to me that like, Jan, this AI safety concern is completely pointless because like once we have AIs that are smarter than us, what they will do will be as unpredictable for us than uh, what we will do is unpredictable to rabbits. Mm -hmm. And then my question was like, wait a minute, why are you involved in a project that (laughs) trying to randomize the world? (laughs) Yeah. Like shouldn't it shouldn't be trying to like make the world a better place rather than a random place. Uh, uh, so, so I do think that this is kind of the responsibility of technology developers in general to think about uh, not only effects, but also side effects and potential bad effects uh, of, their, of their work. Right. So I, I, I agree with you that this uh, unpredictability is a very central aspect to this. And so I think this provably safe AI direction just is unlikely to uh, bear fruit. To, 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 uh, to kind of defend this a little bit, I think uh, you might have provably safe AIs in a way that you have like provably very limited AIs. So you can kind of constrain their effects on the, on the state. Uh, mm-hmm. So like, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can have a provably safe AI. I'm not sure if I would call it AI, but I, I can kind of prove that this thing, uh, given those constraints, like this IO behavior, uh, is just not going to kind of do certain things. Yes. Uh, of course, like there are some assumptions that that always have to go into your proofs. Uh, but I, I, this is just an example of like probably say failure doesn't necessarily mean that these like completely unconstrained things that unconstrained system that we have uh, proven some proven is kind of good for humanity. It might be also proofs of like very hard constraints. 
Yes, I, I agree with that. So, but, but going back to the psychology of this uh, AGI researcher that you were talking to uh, 10 years, I, I, I don't know if you said 10 years ago, but some time ago, I, I often, both in myself and in others who kind of develop new technology, encounter this kind of, I don't know what to say, this sort of Nietzschean or Promethean idea that, you know, look, this is just an amazing hack or amazing gizmo. Let's just build it. Uh, and let's not worry about the risk because it's just so cool. I want to do it. It's just like an expression of my human Promethean spirit that we're just going to, oh, fire. Wow, that could be pretty dangerous. No, 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 we've got to do it. And you could even refine that a little by saying like, well, well, who cares about human utility? I'll just transfer my utility to the existence of these better beings. Like, oh, if, I, if we make them and they go on, it doesn't really matter what happens to us. I'm, I'm just as happy for that timeline or that future path for the universe. And do you think that's the right characterization of the psychology of these people? Uh, I mean, obviously there could be some people who just don't believe in AI risks. So they're just totally unconcerned about it for that reason. But some people I think are fully aware, they fully intellectually grasp that there is this risk and unpredictability there, but they just can't stop themselves from, from pushing as hard as they can still in that direction. Yeah, I think there are kind of like two separate arguments there. Like one is that it just kind of feels really cool to invent new things, and I totally identify with that. Uh, in fact, like when I was uh, at DeepMind, I was kind of constantly kind of struggling uh, with uh, kind of uh, how interesting the discussions were and and uh, and the inventions were. On the other hand, like trying to wear my AI safety hat and, and kind of like <laughs> kind of just uh, shaving off years from the timeline every right. time they kind of invented something. Uh, so I'm very familiar with that, and I, I really don't blame other people for for you know, for feeling like that. This thing that oh we're we're just step in evolution and and we're going to create something something that's better that feels just pure rationalization to me. Like it's it's usually very seldom people have thought put like more than ten minutes thought into into that argument, and it's I think it's just uh, kind of the burden of proof will lie with them if they claim that this is thing is going to be good according to human values or some kind of uh, general values uh, then like they have to like show why why that they're making a prediction and like uh, i'm claiming that this is uh, like sort of what's the word uh, how carl sagan put it like extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence they're making an extraordinary claim mm -hmm. you know the 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 period of history, which uh, reminds me very much of uh, what, what's going on now, is um, when they made the jump between the ordinary fission bomb to the hydrogen bomb, which is much more powerful, in fact, in a sense, unlimited in its power potentially, there was a group of physicists who said, why do you possibly need this hydrogen bomb other than as a weapon of murder? Like, what could possibly come from having this and so there was some disagreement uh, between how hard the U.S. should pursue that next step of development. And, but what ultimately happened when they came upon this so-called Ulam Teller design, this innovation that you know, clearly people saw it had the potential of, of actually solving the technical problem, Oppenheimer, who had been an opponent uh, of going that next step, uh, kind of moral ethical opponent of it, said, well, you know what, uh, when you see uh, something that's technically that sweet, you just have to do it <laughs> and then worry about the consequences later. I mean, literally said that. So so I think yeah. that's in a way like, oh, if it's technically sweet, like you show me some really beautiful arrangement of neural nets that, wow, this will really be able to, you know, instantiate conscious self-awareness in the, in the thing. Well, yeah, we got to do it. I mean, my God, how could we not do that? We got to check that out, right? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that strikes me like uh, some thinking that is like completely understandable psychologically, but like somewhat more than lacking uh, when it comes to that <laughs> cons consequentialism. <laughs> yes. Now, do you, you're familiar with the, the Fermi paradox about uh, why, you know, yes, other way, way. Yeah. So do you think AI risk is, is it plausible for you that AI risk is one of the, well, actually, okay. How, how do you, how do you regard the interplay between uh, development of AI and the, and the Fermi paradox? So my, I mean, my views have evolved over time and I expect them uh, possibly co to continue evolving. My current position is that we are just alone in this uh, Hubble volume. Uh, so there isn't like uh, any significant interplay uh, between 
uh, AI. I mean, there is this interplay, like going back to the, our like earlier point about AI's reasoning about other AI's. If we are alone in this in this uh, Hubble volume, then uh, this AI will not is, will kind of the probability of it actually encountering other AI's in this Hubble volume is going to be very low. So like uh, there should be like kind of like second order uh, effects uh, from it to kind of reason about kind of game theoretic situation uh, where it ends up in making this kind of the argument that it will keep humans around because it's kind of cheap and game theoretically correct thing to do. Uh, this argument, it makes it weaker. So yeah, like I think there are some some interplays there, but I don't, I don't expect like strong interplay. I definitely don't expect right now that uh, like AI risk is something that can routinely terminate civilizations because like, then we would just see AI is coming, <laughs> coming around. Yeah, that's, that, that's where I was heading, but then I, I realized, yeah, but then we would see AIs <laughs> unless they, for some reason, they're hiding from us or something. Yeah, I, in general, I do think that like, uh, like if we expect the universe to be teeming with uh, like pre, pre spacefaring civilizations, then like I don't think any kind of a particular scenario uh, will be like an argument why we don't see any anyone, uh, because if there are many of them, like some of them will kind of evade these scenarios. Let me let me throw another one at you, and I I, I want to be. Um... Uh, respectful of your time, so we we probably don't have too many more minutes. But if you believe in the possibility of AGI, whether it's a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now, it seems to me, and just just tell me how convincing you find this argument, that if you believe in that trajectory, then the idea that in our future light cone there will eventually be lots of AIs, but then also potentially lots of simulations of less capable beings. Uh, automatons. If you sort of think that's a plausible future light cone for us, it it seems to raise substantially the odds that we might ourselves be in a simulation right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you feel about that. Uh, 50 fifty fifty. <laughs> okay, so that's like, fair. I, that's fair. I, mean, I find that there is like uh, I I do believe kind of two different arguments, and they sort of cancel out when it comes to kind of sort of intuitively intuitive surprise. Uh, so one is I do believe in simulation argument. Uh, I, I, I do think that there's a lot of si historical simulations that are happening in the multiverse, but also believe in multiverse. So it's I do think that at least even like, I mean my friend Max Tegmark has this entire kind of categorization of of different multiverses, and you only need one of them to be true. You just need the the universe to be sufficiently large for every once in a while there being like a podcast like that, right? So mm -hmm. so. Uh, so if the universe is sufficiently large uh, in, in some, some dimensions, then like some of our copies are simulated, some of our copies are, copies are real. So like it makes this, in a, in a single universe, there's a super dramatic question, like are you simulated or not? It's like one bit of information. Uh, so therefore it kind of like very kind of makes you kind of uneasy. Whereas like if you kind of already start thinking of yourself as a group of people that are just spread over over uh, the universe or over the multiverse, then yes, some of them are are simulated and some of them some of them are not. It's just a fraction, and th therefore, like less dramatic question. Yeah, I, I agreed with you. I agree with you. And I, I actually, some time ago, I wrote some blog posts formalizing this a little bit. Where if you, you know, if you if you give the standard simulation argument, but you have in mind sort of classical computers that you know the simulations would be run on. Given that it seems plausible now that uh, quantum computers will eventually be made and will work, you, one should think this through a little bit more. And, and then it seems like in addition to uh, having some non-trivial probability that we live in a simulation, there's this non-trivial probability that we live in a simulation in a quantum computer, in which, we, in which case our simulation is a multiverse, and um, a quantum multiverse. And so uh, that, that didn't seem to have been um, considered very much because I think it was only just as AI became more and more plausible as technology got better, it's only very recently that uh, super powerful quantum computers, which inside them, if you understand quantum computing, you realize inside of them there's a un undecohered coherent state inside, uh, un undecohered pure state inside that uh, giant uh, super quantum computer. And that thing is actually then a quantum multiverse. Um, 
hasn't although, hasn't been discussed. But go ahead. Yeah. Although, like, uh, I do think that it's if you start counting simulations and if you assume that the, there is uh, like concern about resource use is uh, universal, uh, then like you, I guess you should expect most of your copies to be uh, located in uh, universes that are like fairly like fairly poor resolution when it comes to like a micro micro world. It kind of like yeah, just <laughs> just similar. Like I mean, I'm a former game uh, game developer. Yes. And, and what they do in games is just like you simulate just the field of view, and what's hap what happens behind your back is just like very poorly. Uh, roughly, roughly simulated. So, like, there might be a lot of uh, things that kind of feel real to conscious observers. But, like, in the when you look at the mechanics of simulation, it's just like smoke and mirrors. Yep, I, I agree with that. Actually, to get into the real physics, theoretical physics weeds, um, we once I I wrote some papers with a guy called Tony Z, uh, who's another well-known theoretical physicist, about this question of if in fact there is a kind of research resource constraint, are there implications of that on the true nature of Hilbert space, whether Hilbert space really is this fully continuous uh, complex space or whether it could be have some hidden discretization that we haven't found yet, even in the structure of Hilbert space. And the other place where it has some implication is in the, the, the measure problem in many worlds quantum mechanics where um, it's not clear how the measure is imposed and the measure might be imposed by resource constraints uh, by the, the thing which is actually doing the simulation. So anyway, um, it's getting a little bit uh, into, the es into the esoteric there. It's getting uh, too interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let me, so I think we're over time. So let me uh, conclude by um, saying it's, it's been great having you on the show. We'd love to have you back uh, some other time. And uh, I, anything that, anything you want to throw out there that we should put in the show notes that, so given that our audience is not primarily rationalists, a lot of people in academia, a lot of scientists, a lot of um, writers and journalists and things like that, what, what's, a, what's a thing that you'd like them to read about uh, AI existential risk? Or So I do have like this uh, link collection that I, that I kind of update uh, every once in a while. It's almost like a meta, meta link collection. Coll because it includes links to <laughs> links to link collections. Uh, so yeah, it's just yarn.online slash xrisk. Great. We will include that in our show notes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to thank you. And uh, I hope that we get out from under this COVID problem so you can return to your super awesome lifestyle of traveling the world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Take care, Jan. You too. Bye.